Hello everyone, welcome to church tonight. If you could stand up once you find a seat and we're gonna sing some songs together. Oh, there's a second on button. I learned that for the first time. There you go. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to church. It's so good to see you here this evening. Um, If you are new to our church or newish to church, uh, we exist as a church to help you take your next step with Jesus. Um, It's on there as you walk in. You can look at it on the way out. That's why we are here. We would love to help you with that. Uh, One reason we do that is through a QR code, which I think um, 
Can I go back? Oh, there you go. I haven't done that before either. Today is very exciting. I've got all the digits, gadgets. All right, one way we do that is to use QR code on screen, which you can scan on your phone. Um, enables us you to ask, uh, like ask questions from something you heard today to um, ask for prayer um, or something like that. If you're here at the church, there's other things you can do with that, such as if you want to serve in ministry, you can do it that way. And today I thought we'd do something fun. Um, now, rumor has it that the young adults' population struggle with something the young people call riz. Now, if you're older, you may not have heard the word riz. It is short for charisma. It is essentially the ability to talk to or attract people of the other gender. Now, because they struggle, I thought we'd like to help them out. And through the QR code, we would give our best Christian pickup line to help them start these important conversations with a significant other. So one example would be from Emma Moxham, who gave it to me, and she's married, so it must work. She said, and the, the line goes, I was looking through the book of Numbers, and I found that I didn't have yours. There you go. Successful, though, so there you go. Um, now, I want you to give it a try. Everyone get your phones out. We'll give you some time to give it a go, um, and I'll put something on the Facebook page, my favorite ones or uh, whatever it is. Um, just a way to get you used to the QR code and have a bit of fun as well. Um, now, though, um, after a, a few seconds or minutes, um, we'll hear from some notices, starting with Gary. I'll just give you a bit through that first. Thanks, Jacob, for that introductory activity. I'm still really busy just doing that, so just <laughs> take another five seconds. I don't know why I'm sending this, because I'm the person that will actually read them, but I'll, I'll amuse myself with that one. That was quality. So, uh, welcome to church. A uh, couple of our number, uh, Sam and Flynn, are involved in a program called Year 13. That is... Uh, a year-long program where they spend two days a week at Youth Works College, where they learn about the Bible and ministry, two days a week volunteering here, serving at church, and two days a week in uh, paid work that they, they do as a job. And so a part of their Year 13 experience is a one-month mission trip in Fiji. And so the dates and the times there, May the 11th, 6.30 p.m., they're going to have a fundraiser night. So please put that date in your uh, personal organiser so that you can be there not only to show your support for Sam and Flynn, but also to help them raise funds for the costs of flying over to Fiji and so on. Uh, this term we'll be doing park training again. Park training is the uh, ministry that we have to, that seeks to train members of our church to serve in works of ministry. And so we've been running this course over seven Monday nights, various terms over the last four years. Uh, we're going to do something a bit different term to this year. We're going to be running it on two Saturday mornings. You'll see the dates there. We'll be running a course on how to lead Bible study well. That'll be uh, one of the courses that we run. Also on the first of those two dates, May the 18th, we'll be running a course of training for people who want to be involved in our life course. And in the second of those two Saturday mornings, we'll be running a course on accessibility and disability issues in ministry. So there'll be more information coming about park training in term two. We'd love you to sign up for one of those courses. Uh, and in starting on June the 3rd, we'll be running a four-week course called the Life Course. It is especially designed for people who want to investigate and check out the Christian faith, if that is something that is a little bit new to them, or if you've got friends who would be interested in coming along. The evenings will be lots of fun. There'll be a dinner served at 7 p.m., followed by a short talk and a chance to ask questions and have a discussion about the things contained in the talk. Uh, the talks will really focus on Jesus, who he is, and what difference he makes to our life. So again, there'll be more information between now and June the 3rd when that course kicks off. I'll hand over to Ellie. Hi everyone, we have a young adults outreach event coming up and this time we're having a movie night on the 1st of June as you can see on the screen. 
So add that date to your calendars and start thinking about who you might like to invite along. It's a great low pressure night to invite along non-Christian friends to introduce them to our church community. And stay tuned for more info to come. Hi everyone. Um, coincidentally, I wanted you to get your phones out as well. So get your phones out and I'd love you to go to settings if you have an iPhone. If you don't have an iPhone, I'm not sure what you should do. But go to settings and go to screen time. <laughs> now, I don't think anyone's going to be able to beat mine. I've got five and a half hours, which is a daily average. Can anyone beat it? Yep. But you're, you're for work all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of mine's work. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else go bigger than, yeah? What have you got, Gaz? 541 to Gary. Must be a ministry thing. Yeah. Alistair? Six hours 40. Okay, that's pretty, pretty impressive. All right. So this always gives me a bit of a shock because, yes, I do use my phone for work. But I also think there is a fair bit of that that's probably not cat videos, but maybe like icing cake videos or weird kind of things that smash and I don't know what it is. But things that are really a little bit pointless. I can think of a much better use of my time, a much better use of the five and a half hours that I might have spent on my phone on a Saturday. And that would be to go to a fit women's conference. So if you have maybe four hours plus, think about maybe using your time even better than just spending it on a phone and coming along to this conference. Now, it's on a Saturday in June, but I'm giving you lots and lots of notice so you can put it in your diary. It's on the 22nd of June. Um, the times are to be confirmed, but we'll be watching a delayed live stream live stream of some great Bible talks, a terrific time to get together with other women in the congregation and we'll be um, having some food together, we'll be doing some different activities and it's just a really great day. So pop that in your diary. It's going to be the afternoon on Saturday the 22nd of June. Thank you. One final announcement is that these glasses were here at the end of church last week. Uh, they are going to be left down here if you think they might be yours. We now come to the time where we are going to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus, specifically as we eat and drink together. Uh, we're going to do it a little bit differently this afternoon. Uh, that is, we're going to serve you so... Uh, Jess and Al, uh, Harry and myself, we'll, we've divided you up into four and we will come around and uh, you will just help us by distributing the, um, the plates with the bread and the cups along your row. So if you could help us out, we'll see how we go. But we're going to begin preparing for sharing in the Lord's Supper uh, by confessing our sins together. And you'll see the words on the screen. We're going to take a moment just of quiet reflection on our lives and then if you would join together in the words that are found on the screen in bold. I'll give you a moment just to reflect and then we'll say these words together. Knowing the goodness of God and the times we fail to respond with love, and obedience, let us confess our sins together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. 
you embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of the supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And with the whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join in the eternal song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. So what we'll do now is distribute the cups to you in your seats. When you receive them, hold on to them. And then when we say those words, we will eat and drink together. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
We're going to sing again, so if you could please stand with us.
everyone, my name is Cooper, and I have the privilege of doing, of doing the Bible reading for today. Uh, today's reading is Acts chapter 4, verse 32, to chapter 5, verse 16, and it can be found on page 1,660 of the Church Bible. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put out the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. In great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Thanks, Cooper. One of the most tiring things about parenting, especially when children are young, is the need to constantly discipline them. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but children, when they come out, know absolutely nothing. I mean, they're in there for nine months. Surely there could be, uh, you know, kind of welcome to life video playing. That's time that's just not well spent. But that is really tiring to have to teach children everything that they need to know about life. And discipline that parents provide generally takes a couple of different forms. There is the discipline that we normally think of as discipline. Child does something wrong, parent identifies that behaviour and then introduces to them some unwanted consequence to try and train them and associate them with that this is not a behaviour that they should repeat. And then there is the discipline that is the kind of constant discipline of training. And both of these kinds of discipline could be at play with a fairly mundane but very, very important thing like teaching children how to cross a road. Uh, if I'm crossing the road with my child and they let go of my hand, then I will be likely, uh, if they run away or run across the road, I will be likely when I catch up with them to deliver them a smack. Now, Alex still complains about this, but he needs to learn. <laughs> and I will tell this child that, that that smack that they received is just a small, tiny proportion of the pain they would have felt had a car actually hit them. That's the example of the first kind of discipline. But there is a constant form of discipline that parents provide for their children, and that is that something that they're always doing. They are training 
teaching their children all the time. So if, take the example of crossing the road. If I'm approaching a road with a child, uh, I am talking to them about how it is we're going to cross. Look, this is the place where it's safe to cross and we're going to look this way, we're going to look that way. Notice roads are dangerous. We need to be careful. No running, no being silly. We need to cross. I will hold their hand and restrain them. This type of discipline is more along the lines of training, but it is discipline nonetheless. Now, I take it that God, who is in the Bible called our Heavenly Father, is always using both of these kinds of discipline as well. He is always speaking to us, always training us, always persuading us on the best way to live as we read the Bible. And I take it, however, that he will also bring the other kind of discipline to bear on our lives at times. That is, that is, he may bring unwanted consequences or circumstances in, into our lives in order to discipline us. Now, clearly, the curious case of Ananias and Sapphira is an example of this kind of discipline. Uh, it is, I would say, not an easy passage. It contains unnerving and disturbing ideas, and we may well, at the end of this talk, be left with questions. But I think we do need to face what this passage says to us about God and about his discipline. Now, up until this point, if you've been following in the book of Acts, up until this point, the Christian movement in the first four chapters of the book of Acts has kind of been this ideal uh, and perfect community, maybe a, a little bit too perfect. We see at the end of chapter 4, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work among them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land uh, or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is a kind of Christian communalism. But this happy Jerusalem jamboree for Jesus would not last forever. And we see here in this blip with Ananias and Sapphira, we see it again in chapter 6 with the problems over distributing food fairly amongst different groups. And then uh, by the end of chapter 7, a bomb is put under the entire enterprise so that the believers in Jesus who were stationed in Jerusalem will be scattered after the murder of a man called Stephen and the outbreak of whole-scale persecution against the followers of Jesus. So this happy camp out probably lasted in Jerusalem probably three or maybe five months before the persecution started and the people were scattered. And we see actually, interestingly and ironically, that it is this persecution that scatters the people that actually leads to the mission of Jesus taking its next step geographically outwards from Jerusalem. So let's come back to this unfortunate couple, Ananias and Sapphira. What is it that they did wrong for which they lost their lives? Well, firstly, it seems that they were motivated by recognition. The narration of their sin comes at the, after the end of Acts chapter 4, and it's meant to tell us, I think, the end of chapter 4 is meant to tell us something about the motivation of Ananias and Sapphira. Let's go back to the end of chapter 4. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, Ananias and Sapphira claim to do the same thing, and maybe they were keen to be given a nickname just like this guy, Joseph. Maybe having heard that Joseph was now called Barnabas or son of encouragement, what a great nickname, the encourager. What a great nickname. Who wouldn't want a nickname like that from the apostles? Maybe they wanted to be known as Mr. and Mrs. Generosity. Maybe the, the funds that they gave could be used to, to build a building. Maybe there could be a plaque on it with their name and their generosity could be remembered down through the centuries. Clearly, they are driven by a desire to be recognised. Secondly, they use deception to make up for their lack of faith. You notice uh, what Peter says to both of them. They're both accused of lying. Ananias, of lying to the Holy Spirit. Sapphira, of testing the Lord. 
Now, we don't know exactly what their logic was here, but given their desire to be known for this act of generosity, uh, of the kind that Barnabas was known for, maybe they were wanting to be generous. Part of their heart was wanting to be generous, but they realised maybe this, this thing that had sprung up in Jerusalem, this happy Jesus community, might only last a few more weeks. So maybe they wanted to hold back some of the money as a kind of each-way bet, so that if it did kind of go belly up in a few weeks or a few months' time, at least they wouldn't have given all their money to it. At least they would have held on to something, and they wouldn't have blown the whole lot. Uh, Some people might say, as some scholars who've thought about this passage have said, well, clearly these two people are not real believers in Jesus. So God's rather extreme response was designed to keep these two not real believers in Jesus out of the church and to identify them as people who were just along for the ride. But the problem with that is we don't actually have any evidence in the text that says these people were not really believers in Jesus. So we can't resolve the tensions that we feel about this passage by saying that they were not true believers. And thirdly, they claim to be, oh, it's clear that they are guilty of hypocrisy. It's interesting to note, however, what they are not guilty of. They are not guilty of failing to give 100% of the proceeds of the sale of their property. Peter says as much in verse 4 when he says to Ananias, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? Ananias, this money was yours to do whatever you pleased with it. We don't have a law about this kind of thing. It's not as though the, we have a rule saying you have to give it all. But what he was, was hypocritical. He wanted to appear to be one thing, to have given 100%. And yet, he, in reality, he was not. And sadly, his wife lied to cover up this conspiracy that she had with her husband. Now, I think you'd have to say, reading this, This is an unnerving example of God's discipline on this couple. And we might be pleased to think, well, maybe that's just one of those things that happens in the book of Acts that never happens again. But the Apostle Paul, in his writing to the church in Corinth, alludes to something that's kind of similar to this uh, as he writes to them about the way that they are eating together. Now, we have just shared the Lord's Supper Uh, in the the tradition of what we read of in the Bible. But it's clear that when you go back to the New Testament, the way the early church celebrated the Lord's Supper was in the context of a real meal, kind of more like uh, what you're all invited to share in over in the big hall after church finishes. Uh, It's in the context of a real meal. And what was happening in this church that the Apostle Paul is writing to is that some people were getting there early. They would eat and drink and have their fill and be merry. And others who were less available or able to get to the church gathering on time would come later and they would find the tables being picked over and everything's kind of half gone and maybe some of the people who ate earlier have already left and this meal that was meant to be a reflection and uh, to symbolize their unity actually served to demonstrate their disunity and so the apostle paul as he's talking to the church writing to them about this problem he says something to them in 1 corinthians chapter 11 He says, your behavior, that, that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. You see, I don't think that we can say that God cannot and will not bring into our lives discipline of this kind. And I think we need to be reminded of this in our day and age, a day when I think we as Christians can tend to think some rather strange things about the way God deals with us today. That is, many Christians are prepared today, I think, to see most clearly Uh, God's loving hand in their lives when everything's going fine, when everything is well, uh, when the kids have straight teeth and the car works fine and the sun shines on my holiday, that's when I'm prepared to say, wow, I'm really experiencing the kind, loving hand of God upon my life. We are far less inclined to see the loving discipline of God in our lives 
when things are difficult. Now, a very important passage in the Bible which bears this out comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. It contains an extremely important lesson for us to keep in mind. Verse verse 7 is the most important, this first little phrase. He says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Now, notice carefully what he says back in verse 7. Endure hardship, whatever that hardship may be, endure it as discipline. When some bad thing comes into your life, some hardship, some difficulty, even some tragedy, the writer to the Hebrew says, treat that thing, view it, Benefit from it as an opportunity to be disciplined and brought back to God. That is, I take it that he's saying that hardship will come to us for a whole raft of different reasons. We may do something foolish or wrong and be disciplined as a result. While I know people who have developed lung cancer, who've uh, hardly ever smoked at all in their life, a life of smoking may well lead to lung cancer. Uh, Some examples of hardship that we experience may come from a fairly clear cause and effect. If you break the law and get caught, you will be punished. But other times, of course, our hardship comes and there is no clear link that we can discern between the hardship and our actions. And I think what the writer to the Hebrews is saying is that even when we don't know why a particular hardship or suffering has come to us. He says, endure it, consider it, benefit from it as a form of God's discipline. Even if it is far from clear that this thing has come onto our path because of something that we have done. The writer to the Hebrew says, benefit from it, nonetheless, as as an opportunity to be brought back to God. You see, our problem as finite humans who do not know everything like God does is that in many cases, maybe in almost all cases, we may not know whether our suffering finds its root and source in God's discipline or not. But the lesson of Hebrews 11 is to say no matter where it comes from, treat it as God's loving discipline. Be trained by it. Grow from it. Let the experience of hardship draw you back wake you up and strengthen your faith in a world and at a time when ease and wealth and comfort provide the perfect situation for us to fall asleep in our faith. And yet the curious case of Ananias and Sapphira is an unnerving one. I think it demonstrates to us how much the church matters to God. People bought with the blood of his son are of immense value to God. And God will protect his church from danger, whether from outside or even whether from internal dangers like the actions of a couple like Ananias and Sapphira. But it still leaves us with some uneasy questions. Why doesn't God always protect his church in such extreme ways? I mean, if you look back over the history of the church, you can see people who, you know, really should have gotten smoted early on in life and it would have saved the church a whole lot of dramas and dangers and sadness and harm. Questions like, if God does discipline me, how do I know he still loves me? I'd like to conclude with a poem written by an American pastor uh, called John Piper who wrote this poem called Peter, Ananias and Sapphira. There in a lonely field unsold, the graves were only hours old, where Ananias and his wife lay dead because the breath of life once freely given 
by their God has freely ceased, and thus the rod of wrath and justice fell upon their sad deceit. The light of dawn had not yet lit the dismal field, nor any rooster revealed the imminence of day. Beside the simple graves where he had cried, through half the night, there on a stone sat Peter, staring, numb, alone. All night the scene ran through his head, again and then again, the dread look on his face, and awful sound as Ananias hit the ground, and died at once because he lied to man and God. For what? Some pride? Some suicidal passion for a little cash, a little more? To spend on what now from the grave? O oh, Ananias, why? Why crave what you already owned? All night the scene filled Peter's mind, and fight against it as he might, it came again. We sold a field, and claim now in the presence of our Christ, this is the sum now sacrificed, for love of Jesus and the poor. Take this, we pray, and may it cure some sickness of the flesh or soul. But even while he spoke, the whole deceit was opened to the mind of Peter by the Lord. I find your liberality smells more of hell than of our sweet Christ. Before you sold this field, was it not yours? And afterward the same? How lures this money than your soul to lie to man and God? What will you buy with money you have got by such a foolish scheme? However much in all the world will it recoup the cost of making God a dupe? Before he could say any more, the man collapsed, and on the floor the cunning seller of his land was dead, his money in his hand. And Peter stood as speechless as a corpse before the God who has the right to give and take the breath of life and set the time for death. This was not his design, nor did he know that God so swift would rid the church of such a sin. And while he trembled there with brazen guile, Sapphira, Ananias' wife appeared. And Peter thought, This life as well, O Lord, will you require? She smiled and said, It's my desire, just like my husband's, that the sum which by the grace of God has come into our hands by selling one of our large fields be given and none of it be kept for us. Praise be to the God who is for us the key to wealth and happiness. The look on Peter's face perplexed and shook Sapphira for an instant. Then she smiled as Peter asked, And when you sold it, was it for this price that you bring here, she said? Precise and to the penny, like our love for Christ, and what we're dreaming of as you take this and bless the poor. We trust you, Peter, it is sure. A man of God does not deceive. She wondered at his tears. I grieve, he said, to ask why this accord to test the spirit of the Lord between you and your husband, when the world would have been yours? Or can you buy eternal life unpriced when you have made a fool of Christ? The feet of those who buried your accomplice come, and it is sure as you were one in lying breath, God says you will be one in death. One mercy now remains, how brief today your widowhood and grief. All through the night, again and then again, he cringed and saw the men first carry Ananias to the grave and then Sapphira, through the fading light of day like two limp flowers cut from where they grew and tossed away. But then as day began to break and night gave way to early morning grey, a sound pierced Peter's mind and turned around the way he saw the world, a bird, a crowing rooster. And when he heard the voice of this old friend, the night came back to him when he, in spite of all his boasts, fell like a leaf before a breeze and his belief denied i do not know the man he said oh yes you're from his clan the servants of the priest declared we've seen you with him you're just scared to tell the truth i do not know the man he said again you show that you're from galilee by how you speak and so he took a vow and with a curse said one more time i do not know this man the crime that he committed in those lies now rose before his weary eyes. A thousand times more heinous than Sapphira's lies or of the man who put her to it. Peter sat there trembling, weak and stunned now at the difference. Lord, why? He cried. 
My sin is worse. Three times I lied while you were suffering for me. I do not know why this should be, that they should die and I should live, or how you wrath and mercy give. He lifted up his hands and said, O Lord, why did I not drop dead? And then the Lord replied, it's true. My friend, your sin was worse and you deserve the countenance of wrath far more than these two here. Your path led straight to hell and if I would have let you go, no power could have kept you from the flames. I did not owe you this, nor is it hid from open sight that you, my friend, are saved by grace and in the end are chosen unconstrained by good or evil deeds that would or could be made the root of my decrees. In heaven and on earth, I please the counsel of my wisdom first. For centuries, my name has burst, the chains laid on my will by man, when he presumes to shape my plan around his self-defining will. A futile thing, for I fulfill the purposes I formed before the world was made. Do not make war against my freedom, Peter. All that I have ever done to call and carry you is free. Receive the gift and tremble as you grew beside these graves. If it were not for grace, this would have been your lot. They fell before your feet depraved that you might know how you are saved. Then speechless, Peter rose and set his face to follow Christ and let each breath and trace of faith display the way that sovereign grace holds sway. And now, as we light candle too, may Christ illumine me and you to see that we deserve no good from him, and sovereign justice would be served if all of us fell dead at Jesus' feet. But if instead we live and stand before his throne, let thanks be given for grace alone. And let the one who doubts say this, it is my everlasting bliss to know that God elects not by our works, but his decree. And I dare not use my iniquity to prove that he rejected me. O precious promise, sweet command, trust Christ alone and you will stand. In his sometimes sweet and sometimes severe mercy, God is so powerful and so wise that not even our sins are wasted as a means by which God calls us back to trust in Jesus. In the end, our unnerving questions must give way to gratitude. Why Ananias and Sapphira and not Peter? Why them and why not me and my sin? In the end, we must thank God because everything good we have comes from Him. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank You for Jesus. Thank You that even through the evil which led to His death, you brought good. We thank and praise you that even the sin and evil in our lives, you can use to teach and train us, to draw us back so that we might keep on trusting you. Help us to endure all hardship and difficulty as your discipline so that we might not fall asleep, but that we might keep trusting Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Shall we stand for one final song of worship? Sing with me how great is 
our God, and all who will see how great, how great is our God. In age to age, He stands, and time is in His hand. Friends, I'm Camille, and now we're going to spend time in prayer. So please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you because you are the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. You are steadfast and kind. Your love for us is more than we can imagine, and your understanding is unsearchable. Thank you for your faithfulness, even when we are not faithful. Thank you for the day you have given us and the many blessings you provide to us. Lord, we are so thankful for the wisdom and the knowledge found in your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand and accept these truths. We ask that you may grow our hearts to be teachable, humble, gracious, and to continue to grow in your love. We praise you in adoration for you deliver us from our troubles and help us in times of distress. You, Lord, have control over everything and every circumstance. In times of weakness, Father, please give us strength to turn to you first as our rock and refuge. Help us to seek after you in times of joy and in times of sorrow. Father, thank you for the many ways in which you have grown Park Road Anglican Church this year. We give thanks particularly for the increase of ESL students turning up each week and for Anne Madden and the team who assist in building relationships with the ESL community. We ask that you may continue to bless this ministry and help the volunteers to find appropriate ways to assist the individual needs of the students. And please grant them with opportunities to share the good news of Jesus in a clear and loving way. Loving Father, Thank you for the work of the Pearsons in Gumbalanya as they faithfully proclaim your word to the Aboriginal community. We ask that you may help guide Matt and Pastor Lewis 
with wisdom in the way they engage with others. Help them to be an encouragement to the Aboriginal community and may you guide them in discipling other Christians. Almighty God, you are worthy to be praised. Your power is infinite. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross on our behalf. Thank you that this means we are now reconciled and have peace with you. Thank you for this good news and help encourage us to share Jesus with those around us that do not know you. We pray for the upcoming life course launching in June at Park Road. And we ask that you may use this course to help those exploring Christianity to consider the claims of the Bible and to be open to asking questions in order to see true life through you. Please also help those who are running and facilitating discussion in the life course to find wisdom and knowledge in your word and help them to care for those who attend. Father, thank you for the smooth running of the annual general meeting held recently. Thank you for the faithful members of, the Park, Ro of Park Road who have been appointed in positions of leadership, including the wardens, parish council, bookkeeper, as well as the various other roles. We ask that you may use their gifts to serve alongside Gary faithfully, and most importantly, help them to look to you in making choices and decisions that honour you. Lord, we also give you thanks for the recent term of Bible study and for the new members who have joined. Thank you for the leaders who, grew, who led the study through Acts, and we ask that you may help those who attended to grow and be challenged by your word so that we can take our next step with Jesus. We also bring before you in thankfulness our MTS apprentice, Ethan. Thank you for the work that he does at our church, including starting up the Kids Club Ministry on Friday afternoons. Please help the leaders involved to care deeply and be a good example of your love so that the children may grow to know you. Psalm 86, verse 11 to 13. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. Father, help us experience this stillness and know that you are in control. Amen. Thank you, Camille. So tonight we have dealt with a difficult, pa sorry, <clears throat> a difficult passage, and you may have further questions about that. One great way, and please feel free to use it for this, to ask those questions may be to use a QR code on screen. Um, but we've also been given an important encouragement. God is a loving Heavenly Father, um, will discipline us just as our loving earthly parents will and do need to as well. And what this means is that when we are um, suffering, whether we know the cause or not, we have been encouraged to take that as an opportunity to reconnect with God, to reflect on the ways in our lives where maybe we've failed to live for him or have fallen asleep in our faith. And therefore, we can take every opportunity to reconnect with him um, and to continue to trust in Jesus. So I'm going to pray in the back of that, and then I'll tell you what's happening next and a bit more about the QR code. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've dealt with a difficult passage tonight, but we know everything in the Bible is there for a reason, call, calling us to understand you more and what it means to live for you. We thank you for the reminder that as a loving Heavenly Father, you discipline us. Please help us when we experience some form of suffering, whether we know its cause or not, to take it as an opportunity to reconnect with you, to continue to trust in Jesus, and to praise you for your great mercy and grace for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the reason I'm bringing up the QR code again is because I was asked by multiple people, so I'm glad it's important to some people that they didn't have an opportunity to submit their um, Christian pickup line. So, if you want to do it for that reason, or you've got a question, please use that. Um, otherwise, we're going to head over to the big call um, and have a meal together. That's also a great way to chat through what we've heard about tonight. Um, if you're a newcomer, please join us. It's free. You don't need to pay anything. So who wants to say no to free food anyway? Um, we'd love to have you with us. Um, so see you all over there, and thanks for coming to church. <laughs>